Uh, so hello, my name is Sarah Luttrell. I'm the Communications and Events Manager at the Center for International Development at Harvard University. I'm really excited for today's discussion on the social socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 on households globally. Um, the format for today's dis discussion, as usual, is a 20 to 25 minute presentation, and then we'll leave around 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, today, the, during the Q&A session, we'll have CID Student Ambassador Anna Alvarez moderating. Um, you can submit your questions directly into the chat and also by using your raise the hand function if you'd like to ask your questions directly to the speaker. We're also recording today's session uh, and the video of this event will be available after on CID's YouTube channel. Um, I will also add links in the chat um, to our social media channel and to our email newsletter to hear more about events like this. Um, today is also the final speaker series of the semester but we'll be back on Friday, January 29th. Uh, we have Michael Clemens and Thomas Jin from the Center for Global Development, and they'll be discussing global mo mobility, mobility and the threats of pandemics. Uh, so we hope that you'll, you'll join us and that you can enjoy today's presentation as the last of the semester. Uh, so we're, without further ado, we're very excited to have with us today our featured speaker, Carolina Sanchez Paramo. Uh, Carol is currently the Global Director of Poverty and Equity Global Practice at the World Bank. Her main interests are and expertise include labor economics, poverty and distributional analysis, gender equality, and welfare impacts of public policy. Uh, Carol also has a PhD in economics from Harvard University, so we're happy to have you back. Uh, and thank you for being with us here today. And over to you, Carol. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Asim, for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Uh, what I'll do is I'll share a few slides just to give you a sense for some of the findings, and then you know we can always get, come back to the details as part of the Q and A. Given the audience, I thought that I would you know primarily focus on results, but also give you a little bit of a sense of how we actually organized ourselves from the beginning of the pandemic to date and how you know, we sort of overcame uh, some of the challenges that we encounter in terms of you know, the lack of data and so on, just to give you a sense, not just for you know, what comes out of the analysis, but how the analysis is actually organized uh, you know, once you look inside of, of the black box. Um, so let me share, um, no, hold on. Uh, let me share the presentation. Hopefully you all can see that. All right. Um, okay, so back in uh, you know the early spring, uh, even though we didn't know much about what was happening, it was quite clear that given the nature and the magnitude of the COVID pandemic and the associated economic crisis, we would expect the impacts on households to be quite significant and widely felt. And more importantly, we would also expect them to vary across countries and over time, but also within countries, across groups and locations. Because it was clear that this was a very fluid and to some extent, a pretty uncertain situation. So it was unfortunate in a way that at that, uh, at that time, COVID uh, actually brought to a halt uh, what we you know, call traditional statistical operations, right? A lot of the data collection that national statistical offices around the world perform is actually done face to face. And of course that became impossible with COVID. So we found ourselves, you know, at this particular point in time, in a context where on the one hand, there was enormous need for timely and accurate information on what was happening on the ground. And at the same time, there was a complete dearth of information about what was happening on the ground. And that was really the conundrum that, you know, my team and I faced uh, within the World Bank. So how did we go about this? Well, the first thing that we did was say, okay, maybe we need, you know, to think a little bit about you know, a framework through which we can then work ourselves to understand what are some of the potential channels of impact, right? We don't have a lot of data, but you know, we do have theory, we have an understanding for how some of these things work on the ground. So how would we think about this ex ante? And you know, this is a very simplified way of sharing that with you, but basically we came up with four main channels of transmission from the sort of macro shock, if you want, to households and individuals. And these were through labor market shocks, uh, either in the form of employment losses or income losses, primarily associated with lockdowns, which were quite generalized around the world. 
there was a channel through non-labor incomes. And here we mean both what governments were doing, which really didn't change that much. And if anything, you know, became, if you want, uh, one of the vehicles to provide assistance, but also thinking about remittances, which for, for many poor and vulnerable households around the world are critical in terms of their day-to-day -day, uh, income sources. And this was both international remittances as well as national remittances. Third, it was clear that, again, as economies were locking down, there was a lot of disruption that was created in different markets. And the one that we were here particularly uh, worried about was the food market, where we saw quite uh, significant distortions, both in terms of the quantity of goods that was available in markets and then consequently in terms of prices. And this was particularly a concern in the Sub-Saharan Africa region, where pre-COVID, they were already dealing with the locust uh, uh, invasion and the very, um, I think, dramatic impact that that had had on food supply, again, even before anything happened due to COVID. And then finally, uh, many uh, poor and vulnerable households are extremely dependent on public provision of services, both health and education. So any disruptions to these services affect, of course, everybody in the economy, by, but they affect them particularly uh, because of these dependence. So that was sort of a little bit of our way of organizing our thinking and then trying to see what evidence we could muster on these different channels of impact and, um, you know, and ultimately in understanding what was happening with households. So how did we go about that? Very early in the process, as I said, we really had no data. So the best thing we could do was say, okay, how can we use the data that we have, even if that's pre-COVID data, to simulate the potential poverty and distributional impacts of the shock, and to try to understand a little bit better who is most at risk and who's likely to be the most affected. And I'll tell you a little bit about what those simulations looked like, because I think they were useful at the time. You know, it was, it was information in, in a situation where we really had very little to build on. But at the same time, it also became clear that there would be very important limitations from this approach and we needed to, this, to do something to actually generate data, you know, going beyond simulations. So in parallel, we launched what, what I think was an unprecedented data collection effort covering 100 plus countries at the moment using phone surveys. So basically we called households in different countries and asked them questions about how they were impacted by the crisis. And we've done that repeatedly over the last few months. And I'll share with you some of the results that are coming uh, from that exercise. So starting a little bit with our simulation exercises, um, it is again very clear that you know this is a shock like we haven't seen in many decades and as a consequence the impacts that it is likely to have on poverty will be uh, felt immediately and over the long term. So we are projecting that in the year 2020 COVID-19 and the associated uh, economic crisis could push between 88 million and 115 million into extreme poverty around the world. And this number could go up to 150 million by 2021. And this is the first time in over two decades that we actually see an increase in global extreme poverty, just to give you a sense for the seriousness of the event. If you also then take into account that the crisis is likely to be unequalizing, meaning those at the bottom of the distribution are likely to be disproportionately affected and you know, build that into the simulations, basically things look a lot worse now, but more um, concerning, they look significantly worse over the long term. And I think basically bring into question what's, um, what's usually referred to as the sustainable development goal, goal number one, which is the eradication of extreme poverty. And I think the main conclusion here is that given what's happening in the world right now, we are very unlikely to meet this goal by, 20, by 2030, um, unless there's you know, very significant and swift policy action to prevent that. So then we dig a, li a little bit deeper trying to understand who these new poor are, right? This uh, 88 to 115 million that I just talked about. And what we saw is that, you know, there will be new poor all across the world in different regions, but they are much more likely to be concentrated in regions where there are lots of people and more importantly, where there are already lots of poor people and, you know, therefore high levels of vulnerability. And that's probably not surprising. And that's Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. 
digging a little bit deeper, uh, you know, beyond sort of broad geographic distinctions, uh, the next thing we wanted to understand was, well, but then who is going to be affected? What do they look like? What do we know about them? And what, what was clear um, early on was that we were really facing sort of a dual challenge, right? Because it's obvious that those that were poor before the crisis were being pushed farther into poverty. And, uh, um, you know, you have here some of the characteristics of that group, right, which we knew from before the crisis and, you know, were being exacerbated as a consequence of the shock. But we also now had to deal with a large group of new poor, right? People that either had escaped poverty in the past and now were being pushed back into poverty. And in some cases, people that had never been poor before. And what was interesting here is that this group looked a little bit different from the existing poor. And these already started to raise, you know, important questions about the nature of the policy response. Because now you really have to basically target and reach, uh, you know, with transfers and other forms of support, relatively heterogeneous groups of people that lived in different places, worked in different sectors, and that really added a lot of complexity to the uh, safety net response that was put in place quite quickly by countries. So, as I said, you know, as we were running these simulations and trying to provide um, our teams in the bank, but more importantly, counterparts in countries with, with some information, we were also launching these uh, data collection exercise. Um, most of these surveys are nationally representative and uh, also provide data for urban and rural areas separately. As I said, we are running these through the phones. We designed the questionnaires so that they touch upon uh, the challenge that I described earlier when I talked about the framework. So you have here more details in terms of the issues that the surveys cover. And the approach that we followed um, was the following. That is, we decided from the very beginning that we would be asking a common set of questions, you know, some core questions across all countries so that we could then perform cross-country comparisons. And that's really what's going to allow me to show you the results that I'm going to show you in a minute. But at the same time, you know, we also allow teams to then contextualize other questions so that they could respond to what was happening on the ground in that particular country at that particular form at, and, you know, time. And, and that's been very powerful because, again, it's allowed us to respond to country needs, but also perform some of these cross-country comparisons. So onwards with the results, um, most of the data that I'm gonna show you comes from the rounds that we collected in July, uh, in April through July. Uh, so it's if you want kind of the first round of surveys capturing the first round of impacts. And then I'll say a few words at the end on some of the new rounds that we've got through the summer and early fall and what those look like. So one thing that was uh, interesting from the very beginning um, is that you know, people seem to be quite aware of what the pandemic was and how they needed to respond at the individual level in terms of you know, preventive behaviors and so on, all across the globe and really independently of income levels in country. And that was encouraging because there was a lot of uh, concerns that there was misinformation that people didn't understand. That didn't seem to be the case, at least among the respondents to the surveys. When we ask about how people were impacted uh, by the shock, what you see uh, very clearly is that the impacts on jobs and incomes have been very significant, although there's, of course, quite a bit of variation across the world. So on average, we find that about a fourth of survey respondents report some uh, disruptions in terms of their jobs. So either they've lost their job or they are working fewer hours. And about a third of respondents also report income losses. Again, either they are not getting paid anymore or the profits from their benefits or their self-employment have gone down as a consequence of the crisis. Um, we also see, although you don't have the data here, a significant decline in remittances. So that's that second channel, if you remember that I talked about the non-labor income. And that's much more prevalent actually than uh, the labor income losses. Most of the job losses that we observe take place in the service sector, and a lot of those are actually in the informal sector, not shown here, but I want to highlight that because it's important. And concerning to us is the fact that all of these impacts seem to be much higher among poorer countries, so countries with lower GDP per capita levels. Mm -hmm. 
So what are households doing, right? I mean, they're suffering these shocks on employment, on other sources of income, and they're coping you know, with this in different ways. And what uh, this slide shows you is you know, what they're trying to do to overcome this. So we see a mix of coping strategies that basically combine you know, reducing consumption, you know, just buying fewer things, starting to use some of the savings uh, that these families may have. And when that's not possible, is starting to sell productive assets. And you can see that there's some variation in terms of the strategies being used across different types of countries with you know, the, sale of, the sale of assets and the use of savings being slightly more common in poorer countries. We're particularly concerned about the uh, sale of assets because particularly for poor households, what this means is that that's the one thing that they will be able to use in their recovery, right? To bring back their labor income. And if they are selling those, they are really compromising their longer term productivity and their ability to themselves uh, pull out of poverty. So that's something that we are tracking very closely. When we dig a little bit deeper into the cuts in consumption, uh, what emerges is a very concerning pattern related to cuts in food consumption. And um, you know there are over 40% of households that report somebody skipping a meal due to the lack of money, due to lack of money over the last uh, month prior to the survey. Um, we did not, and you know, you learn a lot of lessons, right, as you, did, as you do this. So we did, we did not ask whether this was, you know, different from before the crisis. Uh, so we can entirely attribute these to COVID or, you know, lockdowns, etc. But there is a very clear correlation between those that report food insecurity and those that report uh, some, uh, you know, having a stop working or working fewer hours. And that this, I think, is suggestive that to some extent food insecurity is a consequence of COVID, but I just want to, you know, highlight that. And again, as was the case before, much higher impacts in the case of poorer countries. So that's kind of your cross-country perspective. But you know, the data that we have also allows you to look within countries and see if there's any heterogeneity at that level. And indeed, there is significant heterogeneity, some of which I think we expected and some of which was somewhat surprising to us. So we do see workers with lower levels of education being more affected. This is actually no different from what's happening, for example, in the US or in Europe, where, you know, people who are educated and work in particular types of jobs are more able to work from home and others aren't. And that already creates you know, a significant amount of inequality in terms of how impacts are distributed. We also see women uh, being much more affected in terms of employment losses. And this really responds to two things. The first one is that women are much more um, likely to be employed in the service sector. And as I said before, that's the sector that is suffering the largest employment losses. And they are also much more likely to be informally employed. But importantly, it is also women who are usually responsible for taking care of anybody that, that falls sick. So when somebody in the household you know, contracts COVID or, needs COVID or needs to stay back, like you know, children don't go to school, it falls again on women to maybe stop working and you know, stay at home to take care of other family members. So it's a combination of these two issues that I think we are capturing here. And then finally, interestingly, there seem to be no um, very significant differences between rural and urban areas in terms of the shocks. Although we do see the agriculture sector featuring a little bit better than the manufacturing and service sectors. So that's in terms of impacts and what households are doing. So what are governments doing? Uh, you know, during these first few months, we've seen uh, governments across the world, including in low-income countries, mobilize very significant amount of resources to provide support to households, primarily through safety net programs, you know, either existing programs or new programs that have been created for this purpose. So we wanted to understand a little bit to what extent this was having an impact, right? A positive impact. And what we find is that even though, you know, the response has been significant when it comes to the mobilization of resources and the efforts that some of these countries are making, it seems to have been somewhat insufficient. And maybe this is not surprising given the magnitude of the impacts, but it's certainly um, at this point a source of concern. So 
what you see here is data on the share of respondents that says that they are receiving uh, social assistance. And that's on average about 20% of survey respondents. Although of course there's huge variation across countries and regions uh, in terms of these. But again, what I wanna highlight is that, you know, coverage rates are yet again, much lower in lower income countries. You know, they have less fiscal capacity, they have less developed programs. So it's been a lot harder to mount a response in that context. Um, and also, um, you know, the pattern emerges that, you know, those that do say that they are receiving assistance, you know, are not necessarily those that you would think are most in need. So for example, a large percentage of those that say that they have suffered from food insecurity are not receiving assistance. And many that are receiving assistance don't seem to be the most vulnerable. And again, this speaks to some of the targeting challenges that I alluded to earlier, you know, when you have to attend to these very different populations, right? The existing poor, the new poor, and so on. Having said that, I do wanna, I, I do want to, uh, sort of say that this data needs to be taken with a little bit uh, of a pinch of salt, because as I said earlier, this is data that was collected early in the crisis. And this was a time when many of these interventions were still being rolled out. So it's possible that we are not yet capturing here the final impact of these programs. To investigate that, we did look a little bit at those countries for which we have multiple rounds of data. And there we do see an increase in the coverage uh, of the population, but it's not very significant. So again, this is something that we'll continue to monitor over time. Going beyond uh, safety net responses and looking at what's happening with public services, which is, if you remember, you know, was one of the other channels that I alluded to when I talked about, you know, our very basic framework. What we see here is significant disruptions uh, on the education sector. And again, this is, you know, I'm talking to people whose education has been disrupted. So, you know, you can imagine how this plays out in countries where we can't do what we are doing right now, that is connecting over the internet. And what we see here, again, is that in poorer countries, there's a much higher percentage of children that basically have become completely disconnected from the education system in any way. And a lot of that uh, is related, of course, to inequalities in access to digital technologies, internet, et cetera. We observe similar disruptions in health um, in the form of people not being able to access health services when needed. But interestingly, the income gradient is a lot, is a lot less marked there. And you know, when, you, when you put these things together and try to take a little bit of a longer term perspective, um, what you see here is, you know, lower learning, lower access to healthcare. Uh, think about the results earlier on food insecurity and the impact that that may have on nutrition. If you fast forward that, this is the seed for much higher inequality in the future. Uh, so this is something that, you know, our colleagues that work on, on human capital at the bank are paying close attention to, particularly as they think about the response to the crisis in the months to come. So maybe not to end on you know, such a sort of grim note, um, I just want to share much more preliminary data uh, from the later rounds that we've collected, as I said, during the summer and in the early fall, and, and give you a sense for what we are seeing there. And you know, we are seeing some changes, and for the most part, those changes are encouraging, although it's very clear that we are not out of the woods yet. So here I just have data on employment and food insecurity, just to give you a sense. So in both cases, there is clearly a recovery. More um, broadly felt, if you want, in the case of food insecurity, although the levels continue to be, I think, you know, significantly high. And then some recovery on employment, but that's much more concentrated in a specific countries and not so broad based. So I, you know, I, I put sort of some of the key findings here. I'm not gonna read through any of those, but I, you know, because you can come back to it, but I do want to highlight a couple of things that I alluded to in passing, but I really want to stress, and hopefully we can come back to it in the discussion. The first one is that no matter what you look at, employment, income, services, food insecurity, impacts seem to be uh, much bigger among low-income countries. And interestingly, the impact of the pandemic itself hasn't really been much worse in low-income countries. That's certainly the case, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where you know, cases remain relatively low, 
and mortality remains relatively low. But what has happened in these countries is that you know, they preemptively lock down following what was done in the developed world. And then they've been affected by the slowdown in the developed world. And therefore, what they are really suffering from is a massive economic shock, much more, much more than a health shock. But the reality is that we see much bigger impacts. And then when you look within countries, uh, we know that these impacts are not evenly distributed. And in many cases, what they are doing is exacerbating pre-existing inequalities. So, you know, that there is quite a deep concern that even as we come out of the crisis and economies recover, many may be left behind, uh, again, because of these inequalities having become uh, much more entrenched and large in the context of the crisis. So, you know, just to tell you that this data that I presented today is actually available publicly uh, to, you know, to you and to uh, everybody else. Um, We've made this available through a dashboard that we launched a few weeks ago that contains at the moment information uh, on 44 countries, but this is gonna continue to increase in the next weeks and months. The idea is to put up all the data that we have for hopefully the 100 plus countries that I talked about. Um, you have data on 14 different topics, 93 indicators, and again, this will continue to grow over time. And the idea is that this allows you to perform, you know, cross-country comparisons, comparisons over time, you know, cross tabulations, et cetera. So I hope that you use this as a resource, you know, um, in your work and as part of your courses. And this just gives you a little bit of a sense for what the geographic coverage is of the effort that we are doing with phone surveys overall and what's in the dashboard uh, now and what should be coming. So, um, so I'll, I'll basically just say a couple of words on the way forward and then stop. Um, so where are we going with this? We plan to continue the uh, monitoring through the phone surveys. They've, they've proven to be very powerful and very useful. Again, in, at the moment when nobody really knew what was happening on the ground. And because of the modular structure of the surveys that I talked about, uh, we are now discussing sort of focusing on new topics as we move forward. And I think the two uh, most important ones at the moment are, you know, vaccines, you know, who has access, do people want to get vaccinated, etc. So we'll be investigating that in future rounds. And we are also um, monitoring, of course, the recovery. And here, part of the concern is that we may see some asymmetries in terms of who was affected and who's able to recover. And again, this concern about people being left behind that I alluded to earlier. We are using this data uh, to inform policy, of course, but also uh, we are doing analysis on it ourselves uh, with a particular focus on understanding the effectiveness of the policy response and also the potential long-term impacts of the crisis, as I talked about earlier. I should have mentioned, and I forgot at the beginning, that there's an effort that is uh, similar to this, uh, but that runs parallel to it, where we are interviewing firms as well. And this is done by colleagues at the bank that focus on the private sector. And we are in the process of adding that data to the dashboard, and that should be available um, as well, I'm hoping early in the calendar year. Um, and then finally, and something that we are very proud of, is that a lot of this data collection was actually done in partnership with national statistical offices around the world, uh, who were, as I said, themselves struggling to, you know, to think about different ways in which they could continue to provide their own governments with timely information. And the idea here is that by partnering up with them, you know, we are building their own capacity so that they can continue to perform these kind of exercises, you know, beyond uh, COVID and, you know, when this is needed again. So let me stop there. I know that was a lot to cover, uh, but uh, again, happy to come back to uh, different issues in the discussion. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, so we will start with uh, Q and A's uh, and you can, you can write your questions on the chat or you can raise your hand. Yeah, we have, Augustine, do you want to ask your question? Yes, I guess I'm muted myself. This is Augustine for the University of Ghana. Ghana. Um, this is a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is a very simple one, and that is, what do you expect in terms of the implications of reductions in income and increases in inequality 
on extreme poverty? I'm asking this question because on aggregate, there tends to be low income elasticity of poverty and also low inequality elasticity of poverty for low income countries. Am I clear in terms of my question? Is it clear uh, to the presenter? Yes, I think so. Uh, Sarah, do you want to do you or do you want to do one by one? How, how do you guys usually do this? Uh, it depends. Sorry, I sorry, think. Sorry, sorry, Anne. Go ahead. <laughs> No, it depends, I think, but I think we can start with this uh, now and then we will start doing a couple of them. Okay, um, so, so the way we are thinking about this, but, but let me emphasize that in a way, you know, we still have a lot of uncertainty, right, about what's playing out on the ground, even though I, I did present all of this data, is that, you know, there's, there's sort of a circular relationship, if you want, between inequality and, and how the, the pandemic is playing out and what do we think will happen afterwards, right? So what we see is that because there are inequalities that predate the pandemic, right? Um, that means that those at the bottom of the distribution are, you know, on the one hand, potentially more exposed to the economic shocks, but also certainly, you know, less able to deal with the impacts of the shock, right? Think about the fact that you know most of the poor and vulnerable certainly don't have savings. Uh, they have very limited or no access to financial, you know, to the financial sector or the banking sector. So you know they can't ask for a loan. They can't smooth consumption as they are suffering these income shocks. They have very limited productive assets. So even if they try to sell productive assets as a way of coping with income shocks, as destructive as that strategy is over the medium term, they they don't they can't even do that. They don't really have much to sell. And again, you know, their kids are the most affected when it comes to school stoppages and, you know, health centers, et cetera, being closed. So the fact that there are already those inequalities means that some groups are being much more exposed and are much more at risk in this context. And then because that is happening, that basically reinforces these inequalities moving forward, unless we have a policy response that very clearly targets these issues, right? That puts cash in the hands of families that are suffering income shocks, that prevents these families from selling the very limited uh, productive assets that they have, that makes sure that families are not cutting down on food consumption and that that doesn't have impact on right? And those are the kinds of things that governments are thinking about. But you know, it's, it's not easy to put those things in action. So the concern here is that not only we are seeing a momentary, if you want, increase in extreme poverty, but that, as I showed at the very beginning, that combined with an increase in inequality means that the trajectory for poverty reduction moving forward is going to be a much slower one because we are going to have to overcome this increase in inequality that the crisis has generated. Oh, sorry, I, I couldn't unmute myself. Okay, I have two more questions. Are there differences in the coping strategies uh, in terms of gender? Have you found uh, gender gaps or differences in the data that you have um, gathered until now? That's the first one. And the second one in, from these trends and in line with the last question, what policies could uh, countries start implementing to try to reduce inequality from this point forward? Like what are the most, uh, uh, the main ones that the uh, countries should start uh, implementing and designing right now. Thank you. Thanks. So a, a word on gender, because I sort of, you know, <laughs> went through that relatively quickly. So if you think about the way we are running these surveys, right, these are phone surveys. So how does this work? Uh, we can only call people that have phones. Um, and, you know, these have to be very short surveys, right? You can't have somebody on the phone for an hour asking them lots of questions about themselves and about their, their family members and so on. So the results that we get are first representative um, at the level of households, but not necessarily representative at the level of individuals, you know, and, and you know, this is a consequence of the way uh, things are done and we can get into the details. But then what that means is that any results 
um, that, that we want to disaggregate in terms of you know, gender, right? Differences between men and women or differences between older people and younger people are representative for respondents, right? So, so what I'm gonna say about gender you know, has to be caveated in that sense when we talk about individual impacts. So as I said, what we see is that among respondents, women are much more affected in the form of you know, uh, job losses and income losses than male respondents are. We don't know, however, whether there are differences in terms of how women and men are coping. We know there are differences in terms of how households are coping. And we can look at whether the respondent in the household is a female or a male, but it's very hard to extrapolate from that and say, oh, is this a female-headed household, right? Or, or are they using a different strategy because there is a woman? We, we don't have that level of granularity. It's something that we are trying to explore you know, for future rounds, maybe increasing the sample of the surveys, or maybe asking a few additional questions um, that um, basically are about other adults in the household so that we can you know, triangulate and have a little bit richer information particularly on gender differences, uh, but we're also worried about youth, for example, you know, younger workers being disproportionately affected, and we don't really know what's happening with them at the moment. So to, to get back to your question, definitely you know, differential impacts on employment, but we don't have a lot of clarity on what's happening in terms of coping strategies, because those are measured at the level of the households and not for individuals. And sorry, on, in terms of the, of the policies, I mean, I already talked a little bit about that in when I when I was uh, responding to the first question, right? Um, in the immediate term, obviously, putting cash in the pockets of people that that don't have income and that are suffering, you know, important income losses is critical to avoid some of these immediate, uh, very destructive responses. You know, going without food, selling productive assets, etc. Right. So that that's in a way trying to put a floor on how far down people can actually fall, but that itself is important. And that is happening. Uh, although of course there's, as I said, huge variation across countries because you know this is a lot easier to do in a country where you can mobilize fiscal resources quickly, in a country where more with more developed safety nets, and those tend to be you know, middle income countries, richer countries, not so much the poorer countries. So again, variation, but I think that part of the response is working relatively well. I think where things are running into huge issues is, you know, on health and education, right? And particularly education. And, and you know, we do see, as I, as I showed, lots of children uh, who basically are just gonna lose a year of schooling uh, because they are not able to connect to whatever little is being done on the digital side. And, and therefore, I think we are gonna need a lot more creative thinking in terms of how do we close these gaps in human capital that have been generated, you know, once we get people back into school, how do you do that? And how do you do that when you now have a population of students that have had very different experiences over the last year, right? Some of them have been connected to school, some of that haven't, some of them have managed to maintain, you know, the knowledge that they had from before because they have more resources at home, some of them haven't. Um, so our, I'm not a, an education expert, uh, but the, the colleagues at the bank that work in the education sector, I know that these are the kinds of questions that they are grappling with. Uh, what to do when kids come back to school, and also what to do to ensure that kids come back to school, right? Because the other risk is that many kids uh, who are always in the fringes, right? Kids in poor families, there's a lot of pressure for them to work, you know, to drop out of school at a particular point in time they have now become disconnected from the education sector, how do you bring them back, right? What kind of incentives can you provide to their families? How do you work with them to make sure that they come back? And that the concern there is actually higher for girls than for boys in certain parts of the world. So those are some of the questions that, uh, that our colleagues are asking. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, two questions in the chat and then one from Mil Milena. The questions in the chat are from Mustafa. How do results compare contrast between urban and rural? Is rural less affected? And that's the first one. The second one is, it's COVID effect, are, are COVID effects on poverty further enhanced by food inflation? All and right, so Milena, you want to, I don't know if you want to answer this first too, and then Milena can ask 
her question or? So I see these two, but what's the other question? Milena, um, hello. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I hope you can hear me. Yes. It was very great uh, presentation. I'm very happy that I'm listening it now. Um, I was just wondering, in all those 84 indicators, uh, have you involved the impact of automation? Uh, I was thinking that. I think we lost her. Okay, so we can start with Mustafa's question and then hopefully he, she returns. Okay, um, so the differences between urban and rural areas. So th there are several. Um, the first difference is that has been one of sequencing, right? And again, I'm generalizing here, but, but in most places in the world, what we saw was the shock first hit urban areas. Uh, just because of the, you know, people live closer together in urban areas, uh, right? Uh, they tend to live, you know, in a smaller spaces. So it was easier for the, for the illness to, uh, to spread. And then a lot of the lockdown measures were a lot more strict in urban areas than in rural areas. So that meant that at the very beginning, we saw much more uh, significant impacts, both health impacts and economic impacts in urban areas than in rural areas. But of course, you know, as the crisis evolves and the crisis sort of unravels, you know, those impacts start to spread because in every country, rural and urban areas are connected, right? Uh, they are connected through markets. They are connected through people. Uh, you know, many rural families have uh, people that have migrated to urban areas. Those people lost their jobs. Therefore, they were sending remittances home. In many cases, they returned to uh, rural areas. So these interconnections meant that, you know, over time, the impacts uh, spread, you know, geographically. And uh, if you think about the results that I showed, which, you know, in many cases come now from sort of June, July, when a lot of these things have already uh, run their course, um, on aggregate, we don't really see very dramatic differences between urban and rural. When you dig a little bit deeper, you do see some differences, you know, at the sectoral level, you know, the agriculture sector. Um, when you ask people that are employed in the agriculture sector, um, they tend to say report less employment losses or lower sort of income losses, which if you think about it makes sense because if, you know, if you are a farmer and you are sort of farming your land, um, it is sort of up to you to, to, you know, to get out every day and, and sort of cultivate whatever you're doing. So you're probably less likely to report that you are not working, uh, but you're certainly going to be affected by any decline in the demand, for example, for food that may happen because, you know, urban areas are closed. You're obviously much more, of, you know, you're going to be affected by any restrictions on transportation uh, that may prevent you from moving your product, you know, to the nearer market and so on. So, you know, some differences, you know, again, once you look at a more disaggregated level. And then the other thing that is also important that I didn't talk about in the presentation is that in most countries, existing safety net programs, right? So, you know, the cash transfers or other programs that were there before COVID are usually targeted to the extreme poor, to the existing poor, which makes sense, right? I mean, that's exactly what you want. Those guys tend to be in rural areas. They tend to be employed in agriculture. So interestingly, even though the shock was felt initially relatively more in urban areas, governments were much more able to provide support in rural areas because they had the infrastructure to do that. And where they struggled initially was to actually provide support in urban areas where you, know, you didn't have that many existing beneficiaries, you didn't have information on who these new poor were, uh, and you really had to come up with very creative ways of reaching them. So those are some of the differences that we see. So again, at the very aggregate level, you don't see a lot of that, but then once you start to get more granular, there are differences both in impacts and in terms of the response. Um, food inflation, this varies a lot by country. Uh, in those countries that already uh, had strained food systems, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, initially we have seen significant increases in prices. Uh, of food, but in others we haven't. So it's very contextual. Uh, and you know, wh where these matters, uh, teams are following these very closely and trying to put in place, you know, food distribution systems, et cetera, to palliate some of these, but it's not a generalized uh, phenomenon. Great, uh, thank you. I think we have time for 
Milena's question. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Sorry, I lost the connection for a second. I wanted, to, I'm going to be quite brief. I just wanted to ask about indicators involved. Have you maybe involved something regarding automation? I've been reading a lot and um, researching about the fact that automation is developing uh, on a really high pace, especially now after COVID outbreak. And it definitely would impact the um, uh, unemployment increase because many jobs will be uh, in the future, just they will just disappear. And it may also influence the general inclusion, uh, especially those um, uh, lower level labor, labor and etc. So I've been thinking, uh, have you involved this kind of a indicator or um, parameter in your, um, in your research? Maybe I missed something, but it's very interesting for me. That's what I wanted just to ask. And thank you for the presentation. No, thank you. Um, so if I remember correctly, I don't think we are explicit. When we ask people you know, about their job losses, uh, I don't think we are explicitly asking about that. You know, We are more focused on, you know, was this due to closure of the business because of COVID and so on. Uh, but there are a couple, I think there are a couple of ways in which the idea of, it's not so much, you know, automation, but, you know, the use of digital, you know, which is a, a part of that. So the first thing that we see, uh, and this comes from the firm surveys that I alluded to, you know, not the household surveys that I presented, is that there has been, you know, during the crisis, a significant move to use, you know, digital platforms and digital technologies, you know, by firms, right, as a way of staying in business. Business. Um, I mean, think about how many of you are using Amazon, you know, et cetera, right? So this is kind of the flip side of that. Uh, and we see this happening again in low-income countries, middle-income countries. So those firms that have that ability, you know, to move onto sort of digital platforms and to conduct their business digitally and interact with their workers digitally by having them work from home are doing that. But who are those firms? Well, those are, you know, larger firms, formal firms, you know, very frequently exporting firms. So again, like what happens with households, you know, you have kind of the mirror image on the firm side, right? The firms that are not able to do that are micro firms, small firms. And because they are not able to do that, they have been actually much more affected by lockdowns and so on, because they don't have a way to continue business or to continue to employ their workers. But, you know, there has been that move towards, you know, more intensive use of digital technologies. And I suspect that some of that will stay after the, after the crisis. So you could see sort of, if you want a permanent effect, right, of, of this adoption of new technologies in a way among certain firms. On the household side, you know, what governments have done is use digital technologies as part of the response in two very concrete ways. The first one is education, which we already talked about. And, you know, on the one hand, the good side of that is that many kids have continued to receive education and we should celebrate that. The bad part is because not everybody has access to these technologies, many kids have been left behind and we will have to figure out how to help them to catch up. The other area where digital technologies have been used very extensively is to pay uh, the transfers, right? Because, you know, I said earlier, oh, you can conduct data collection because you can you cannot have face-to-face -face transactions. Well, you can pay people, you know, their, their cash transfer if this is done face-to-face. -face. So many countries have actually pushed very hard on rolling out digital payment systems for their cash transfer programs. Uh, so we've seen almost like an accelerated modernization, if you want, in the delivery systems for, uh, for these programs that has been in a way triggered by the crisis. And again, there are advantages to that, of course, but there are these risks, you know, those that are not connected, you know, are they being left behind? Are they not receiving the payments? Uh, so that's what I can tell you in terms of where we see technology playing a role. Um, and I suspect, again, that some of these impacts will be permanent and will survive the duration of the crisis. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carol, for your answers to these um, interesting questions and for this very important work. Um, I have shared in the chat uh, links to the public site that you shared um, with that data available for, for folks. Um, this uh, event is also going to be available on CID's YouTube channel, the recording. Um, we're also recording a podcast later with Carol. So if you want to hear more from her, please feel free to check it out on CID's SoundCloud channel.
Um, and thank you again for, for joining us. And this is again the final uh, speaker series of the semester, but we'll be back uh, Friday, January 29th, and we hope that you'll join us then. So thank you, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for your interest. <laughs>